I want to show you how you can cancel a print job before it gets too far that you start printing off a bunch of blank pages and you could say well duh just don't open up the report and if there's blank pages then don't print it. What I'm going off of is the parameter that we learned in an earlier training video on parameter queries and remember you can base reports upon queries. So I've got my customer orders query that when I double click on it it's going to prompt me for those parameters like the start date, the end date, and the name of the company that we made, hopefully made sales in between those two dates. And if there's nothing there, I can create a macro message that says there's no orders during specified period. Now that's for the query, but remember we can base reports upon queries. So when I double click on this, it's going to ask me for the same parameters. So before I get too far, if there's nothing in there after I type in the start date, end date for a client or a company, then we can have that message. Let's just go ahead and do a sample here of 1 slash 1 slash 08 and 3 slash 31 slash 08 and then Camp Spruce hit enter and there's my report between those two dates the orders for the period of January 1st through March 31st I got a total of four so it does work and also it works the other way that if I let's close out double click on it again and I type in dates that contains no sales from that client like hit enter click to zoom in there's nothing there so you can save yourself the trouble of trying to like figure out I mean in the split second or if you got automated to just start printing the moment after you enter in your parameters we can just go ahead and cancel that print job and have a prompt that says hey there's nothing here try again so let's go ahead and close out of here and to do this we want to open up the report in design view right click on the report go to the design view and we want to bring up the property sheet for the entire report and you can do that by double clicking off in the gray area here selection types for the report and we're looking on the event tab and I'm looking at the field right here on no data so if nothing pulls up well let's go ahead and write this macro come over here click on the build button macro builder it's selected click OK and then what we want to do is when there's nothing there we want to have a message so message there we go message box hit the tab key and the message will be and then we can have a beep of course and then the type it's critical no we could say it's informational and then the title we could just say it's our sales no sales during that specified period for that client and then what we want to do after that is that we want to cancel the event so that means that they can't generate the report so let's do cancel there we go cancel event and of course you can add comments to explain what you're doing here if you want to go ahead and type in a comment tab key and say so don't generate report if there's no data on load cancel event. So we can use that one just to go above cancel event. And then we can add another comment. That hits the tab key and it says message to user that there's no data. And you can click and drag that and put it right up at the top there. Close out. And let's see, let's go ahead and do collapse all. So the message to the user, there's no data. That's the message box. And then don't generate report, cancel the event. Let's go ahead and click save, close out of here, and it's an embedded macro proprietary to just this report. Let's go ahead and click save, and then let's right click and run this thing. Go to print preview, and let's enter in a date range where there's nothing there. So, hey, there we go. The sales, it's informational, no orders during specified period. Click okie dokie, and we're done. To send a report off electronically to anybody, including those who don't have access, pun intended, go ahead and select your report as one way to do it and come up here and click on the external data tab. Go to the export group and you've got some options here. You can email it or XML file. In any case, the simplest way for me is to do it as a PDF. So click on that and there it is. The type is PDF. You can change it to XPS, which is proprietary to Windows Microsoft. So if they have Windows, then they should be able to open this up. But if not, let's do PDF. And let's select the desktop. And there's the name, the default name of the report there. So if you're okay with that, go ahead and click Publish. And there we go. Hey, there's the report in PDF. Oh, that's fancy. Let's close out and close out of that. Minimize that down to the taskbar because it's on my desktop. So I can open up my email program, and if you have Microsoft Outlook, well, you can watch my Outlook training videos on how to attach that file to an email, if you'd like. And you can do it that way, or let me go ahead and restore this. 
you can double click to open it up and if you're already in the print preview on the tab here that on the tab over in the data group it allows you to go ahead and export that as well click on it and again just go ahead and name it and then save it to my desktop and then publish it I already have that file on the desktop so I can replace it yes and there's the report again overwrote the file on the desktop linking a table means you want to link to a table in another database to avoid re-importing that table every time there's an update so for example I've got my database here table analyzer and in the exercises folder on the desktop there's the table analyzer and because I'm in it it opens up a copy of it to let you know that when you hover over it in the pop-up that it's in record locking mode meaning that well when I'm working on a record anybody else in the database at the same time can't make changes to that same record in any case we'll talk about that later when we password protect this and here's the other database the unmatched query now in that database let me double click to open it up we've got a couple of contacts and I'm looking at Tim's contacts and so what I want to do is I want to be able to import his table here but as a link into my database so any changes that is made here will automatically update in my database and actually it works vice versa so any changes I make to that link in my database to Tim's contacts here will update it here as well and let's go ahead and do this let me close out of this database and back to mine so to go ahead and to link to that table Tim's contacts in the other database you want to come up here click on the external data tab go to the import and link group click on new data source and it's from a database so we hover over that and it's going to be accessed click on it opens up the get external data window so we just need to go ahead and find it click on the browse button and it's the unmatched query database double click and then down below specify how and where you want to store the data in the current database well I want it to be linked so select that and you can read more about it let's go ahead and click okie dokie and then which table is in that database that you want to link to it's Tams let's go ahead and select that boy and click okie dokie and there we go so you can see the little arrow that's pointing in that means it's coming from outside somewhere in nebulous world and when you hover over it you get the address of where it's at and when you hover over the others you get no address because it's part of this database so when I double click on it to open it up that's what's currently in the other database as Tim's contacts so let's pretend that Max Klinger is not spelled with a K it's spelled with a C so if I go ahead and open up the exercises folder and go to the unmatched query database double click and open up Tim's contacts and say okay Max we gotta change your last name from a K to a C and then of course click off in a blank area and it saves it that when I come back down here and go to my other database hey it automatically updates see I'm in the table analyzer wizard and it's vice versa so in the table analyzer if I'm like no 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 that makes no sense let me click in here and change that back to a K and then shift enter to save it then I come back down here and go to the unmatch click on that to restore the window and hey it's back Ooh, that's fast now let me go ahead and close out of this database here because remember let me minimize that down to the taskbar I hope I didn't lose you that the unmatched query is in this folder in fact let me go ahead and right click on the the access program and close out of it completely there we go so we got rid of those extra locked database icons in any case this is in this folder so from the table analyzer it's looking at the address in this folder so if somebody comes in this folder and clicks and drags and moves them out and says eh, I'll just put them over here well when I come back in here and double click to open it up and I double click on Tim's contacts it says I can't find it it's supposed to be in the exercises folder so what's the deal let's go ahead and click OK and if we find it and we move it back into the exercises folder then we're good but if the person who moved it says no I don't want you to move it back there because I gotta keep it well on the desktop that's okay because we can just go ahead and right click on it and go down to linked table manager opens up the window select the table check always prompt for new location click OK and then well I'm on the desktop so that's where it's at double click to select it all selected link tables were successfully refreshed click okie dokie close out so when I double click it's happy because why when you hover over it you can see the address goes to the desktop not the exercises folder on the desktop so we're back in business of being able to see each other's updates 
through me linking to Tim's contacts in this database. The database properties is a place you can go to to view statistical information about your database, like the size of it, who created it, when it was last modified. You can also customize it. You can add the title for the database, the subject, and some comments. And there's a couple of ways you can get to it to view it. One way where you can view it and make changes to it is within the database itself. Like here, just come up and click on the File tab. Go backstage. Info selected by default. So you can just come over here and it's right there. Go ahead and click on View and Edit Database Properties. And let's go from left to right. First of all, the General tab. The type, location, size of it. When it was created, modified, and accessed. Then the Summary tab. You can add the title, the subject. And I've added some of my own information here. Statistics, well, it's the same as the general, but in addition, if your IT person set this up on a network, you may be able to identify who last saved it, their name and revision number and so on. Let's go ahead and click on contents. We just have tables, custom, like, okay, let's select one. It was checked by, come down below, type in your name and click add. That's it. Click OK and it's saved. It just automatically does that. You don't get a save button here anyway, so let's go ahead and close out. And I'll show that to you by opening it back up. But before you do that, another way to access the properties is that if you see the file, you can right click on it and go down to properties. And there you go, you got the general tab with the size and when it was created, modified, and accessed. You have security, which is a little bit more detailed than what I care to cover in this training video. And then the details. Well, the attributes shared with the owner, and then we have previous versions here, which you can learn more about that. Let me go back to the details because down below you can remove properties and personal information. So all that information we typed in properties or that you saw me type in with the author, like if I don't want to be the author anymore because I'm going to go ahead and forward this database on to somebody else and let them have at it. I mean, I don't want my personal information to go with that, so somebody else can look at that and go, hey, Who's the person behind this? I want to contact them because now they're in charge of it. They're the contact person. So you can go ahead and click on the link, opens it up, and it says you can remove the following properties from this file, and it lists them there. You can go ahead and say select all of them, and then click okie dokie. But if you're not sure what it's going to be removing, you can say, okay, go ahead and create a copy with all possible properties removed. So that way you have the original, and then the copy of it, that shows you what it removed. So let's go ahead and click cancel in any case. Let's close out of here and double click to open it up. Because remember, when you type something in the properties, go backstage to file, to info, to view and edit database properties, custom tab, it automatically saves it. You don't have to hit the save button. Just after you click OK, it's there. It's saved forever. Until you come back here and click on it and say, well, I don't want it there. Select it and delete it. After you worked on your database, it's a good idea to use the compact and repair feature to help maintain your database. For example, when you delete tables, it'll leave empty disk space that fragments and slows database processing time. So, let me go ahead and right click on the database file here and go to properties. And what's the size? 564. Ooh, that's huge. Let's go ahead and close out. Open up the database, double click. And let's delete a few tables here. So let's do orders. Yes and or details. Oh, we're just totally destroying all this, getting rid of our tables and closing out. And then let's right click and go to properties here. Okay, it says 608 kilobytes, but let me click cancel, open it back up. When I come up here, click on the file tab, info selected by default, and I come down here to click on compact and repair database. It goes from 608 kilobytes, click on it, well, in a wink of an eye, it automatically closes the database, crunches the extra space or the fragments, and rebuilds it. So, let's see when we close out. Oh, there it is. Let me click and drag it over here. And right-click on it to go to the properties. Is it 608? No. You see how huge of a savings you got from compacting and repair? I mean, well, okay, it was tiny. But you can imagine if you had a lot of data and it got pretty big, well, the processing time is not going to be fun especially if you have a lot of users accessing the database at the same time with a lot of data.
it's always good to have a backup so if you want to back up your database you can go about doing it your own way or you can use the way that access is provided for us and it reminds me of an old saying if you have one backup you have no backups if you have two backups you have one in other words there's so many ways to lose your data it's best to have extra backups but as far as this training video goes what we're doing is you're just backing up the database once and if you want to create a backup of a backup well that's up to you in any case let's come up here and click on the file tab go backstage go down to save as and save database as come down here there you go back up important databases regularly to prevent data loss I think everybody's database is important so go ahead and double click on it opens up the window does a save as and I'm going to save it to the desktop there's the original database and here's the name of it with today's date so it's July 24th 2017 click save that's it and up here it takes me back to my original database so if I want to access the backup that has that date well then I can close out of here it's on the desktop there's my original and here's the backup well with the date so go ahead and double click and there we go only difference between the two is well this one's stamped with the date in the file name If you want to password protect your database so nobody else has access to it unless they have the password, you can't just come up here and click on the File tab, go to Info, which is selected by default, and then just come down here and say, OK, Encrypt, because it says you must have the database open for exclusive use to set or remove the database password. So what I did is I opened up the database, but not exclusively. When it's exclusively, it means only I can be in here to change the locks or to set the password because if I didn't open it up exclusively and there's other people working in it at the same time and we all decide to go ahead and set the password well what a mess only one person can change the locks only one person can set the password so it says only one of you is able to set it so you have to open it up exclusively and boot everybody else out so to do that and so it's just you in there changing the locks not everybody else at the same time and then we gotta close out of the database and there's my database right there and you don't want to just double click on it what you have to do is you have to open up access so there's access double click to open it up and then you got to open up other files because you just well it's right there the most recent one right but that's not how you open it up exclusively so you can go in the house by yourself with nobody else in there and change the locks and not have anybody else in there at the same time you have to go to open up other files and then you gotta click browse because when you find the file which is well right here on the desktop select it don't double click on it and then come down here and click on the open drop down arrow ah there you go open exclusive because you don't get that option when you double click on it right so you have to do it this way when you select that now it's just me exclusively me nobody else can open up this database while I'm in there changing the locks or setting the password now to set the password come up here click on the file tab info selected by default then come down here and click on encrypt with password and hey there we go PASS I know my passwords easily decoded and then hit the tab key PASS type the same password to verify to make sure that you know you know what you're typing in so it wants to confirm it then hit the enter key on the keyboard and it says encrypting with the block cipher is incompatible with row level locking row level locking will be ignored now because Access 2016 is using what appears to be a newer encryption, it's not allowing for row level locking. It'll be ignored. In other words, it doesn't lock the row preventing somebody else in a record from editing the same row or record at the same time. So, well, that's okay since there's no way to go about changing that as of yet. Let's go ahead and click Okie dokie. And then that's it. Let's go ahead and just close out of here and double click to open it up. Ooh, nice pass hit enter and we're in great now let's go ahead and decrypt it remove the password file info selected by default come down here to decrypt and why can I not do that because you must have the database open for exclusive use to set or remove the database password so set or remove so we got to shoot everybody out of the house open it up exclusively to be able to go ahead and remove the locks so let's go ahead and click okie dokie and you know what we can just leave it open right here and just come up here and click on file go down to open and then browse there it is on the desktop so we don't double click we come down here and we say open exclusive now it wants the password PASS hit enter now we can go ahead and come backstage to file info to decrypt 
and type in pass, hit enter, we're good. So it's gone, close out, double click to open it back up, no password. Oh, that's scary, anybody can open it now. Before deleting an object over here, you may want to check to make sure it's not dependent upon something else or something else is dependent upon it. For example, I want to delete the customer orders query, but the report here is based upon that. Let's say I didn't know that and it wasn't as obvious, you know, customer orders, customer orders, or maybe it's somebody else's database and they don't have the same names. Well, you could do it the tedious way to find out if this report is based upon something that you want to get rid of by right-clicking on it and going to the design view and then bring up the property sheet for the report you know going to the all tab as we discussed in earlier training videos to the record source here and there you go customer order query you can do it that way which is very long and tedious plus if you have a lot that you want to check on because you want to get rid of maybe a lot of tables or queries and you want to find out if you're going to be losing some of your reports that are based upon a query which is based upon tables or it's directly based upon tables instead let's go ahead and close out of here we can come up here and click on the database tools tab and go to the relationships group and find our object dependencies click on that and it says to generate object dependencies the track name autocorrect info option must be turned on enable name autocorrect and continue well if that's what it takes yes <laughs> click ok give it a second there we go and with that report selected you can see up here objects that depend upon me well there's nothing dependent upon this report but how about objects that this report depends upon select it and it's that right there the customer order query right there oh nifty and then you can expand that you can find out what objects that query is dependent upon and good monkeys that's a lot of tables for and let's go ahead and do another we don't have to come back up here and click on it. You can just select another and click on refresh. So if I came over here and did like employee data and then came up here and clicked refresh, updates to the name of employee data. And we got objects that the employee data depends upon, which is two of these tables here. And then objects depend upon that query, Zippo. So as far as getting rid of that one and not having to worry about a report that's dependent upon it, we're good. If you really want to get analytical about what's going on in your database regarding the objects, then you want to use the database documenter. It'll create a report about any or all the objects in the database with controllability on the level of detail, including only those objects that are important to you. And for example, you can look at the design, the details of the objects, the properties, relationship, and user or group permissions of selected groups. Well, let me show you. To go ahead and generate this report, come up here and click on the database tools tab. Go to the Analyze group, and there it is, Database Documenter. Click on that, and go ahead and choose what objects you want to analyze. You can choose all of the tables here, and then go to the queries, include one or two there, cherry pick. I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to keep it simple. Let's deselect all, and just do the customer's table, because believe me, the details on just one is quite a bit, at least enough for the purposes of this training video. So let's go ahead and do customer's table, click okie dokie, and there's the report. Click on it to zoom in. There's the name of the table, Customers, and down below the Properties, Alternate Back Shade, Alternate Back Tint. Great. Wow, that's super detailed. Let's scroll down and look at the fields within the table, referred to as Columns. So you've got the Customer Number field, the Data Type Double, and the size is the max 8 characters long. And you got the next field, customer name, short text, the data type, 50 characters, and, well, aggregate type allows zero length. If it's set to true, that means, yes, it does allow zero length, but it's false, so don't have to worry about that. Let's go ahead and go to the next page and scroll up. And there's the relationships. So you can see customers is related to the orders in a one-to-many relationship. You can take a look at the primary key and foreign key fields that are hooked up and they've got the same names and the attributes and force cascade updates deletes oh this is crazy just so much information my head's going to explode in any case if you want to go ahead and print this off or email it off to somebody you know to print just come up here and click on the big print button and then to send this off well over in the data group you can export this into an excel spreadsheet and reports don't do very well when it comes to exporting, at least for organization purposes. I don't like it, but you may find something useful there. 
text to file or let's do a PDF click on that opens it up the data type is PDF if you want XPS then change it let's do PDF and go to the desktop and well I'll leave the name as is click on publish opens it up in PDF and great and then I can go ahead and email it from within here or what's well, on the desktop close and close out of here and let's close out of there it's right there PDF we can go ahead and open up our Outlook program attach that to an email and send it off and if you don't know anything about Outlook hey great segue go ahead and watch my Outlook 2016 training videos it comes with Office and so if you bought Office I mean hey why not let's learn more about it The Analyze Performance feature is a way for Access to analyze your database and suggest performance improvements. The operative word being suggest, so you don't have to do any of the suggestions. But let's take a look to see what the Analyze Performance has to say about my database and what it suggests to improve its performance. By coming up here and clicking on the Database Tools tab, go to the Analyze group, and click on Analyze Performance. And you can analyze, well, some tables, queries, or how about if we do all, click on all object types and select all, selects all of them, checks them all off, and then click okie dokie. And there we go, the analysis results up at the top, and you can see the legend, light bulbs are ideas, question marks are suggestions, and then exclamation points are recommendations, and then, well, whatever you go with, if you agree and make the changes, it'll show it as fixed. So let's do the first one as an example. Well, you probably can't read it, but it says save your application as an MDE file. Well, what's an MDE file? You can read the analysis notes down below where it explains it. An MDE file is smaller and faster because it doesn't have all the information used by Access in design modes, but you can't make design changes to an MDE file. So if you do this, make sure you got a backup because if you do decide later to make design changes and you just have the MDE file, you're toast. So you got to have that backup. It's always good to have a backup. And then we've got the next one right here. Well, you probably can't read it. Let me go down to the one below so we can look at the one above. So for the employee's business table, it recommends or suggests that you change the data type of the field extension from short text to, I think that's long text. There's no way for me to scroll over to find out. So in any case, we can go ahead and select that, read more about it down below, some generic analysis like, hey, if you use appropriate data types, you can improve the performance, and I agree. And with some of these, like when it comes to relating a table, like relate the employee's business table to the employee personal, if it can do it for you, you can click on optimize and it will create that relationship. Some of these others, well, you can't do it automatically by clicking on optimize. You have to close out and work on it yourself. Again, they're just suggestions that you may find some that are very helpful. I want to show you how you can import an XML data file into your Access database. But first of all, what is XML? It stands for Extensible Markup Language. There's the L, there's the M, where's the X? Well, it's right there. And Extensible for the X and XML. In any case, it's a go-between program of software that is incompatible because of differences in versions or programming. So if you have one program that you want to pull data from and put it into another incompatible program, you can export it first as an XML file and then import that file into your other program. And here's an example down below of these figures. Here I have two incompatible database programs. One of them, let's say Software B, is the Access 2016 program. If I want to be able to share my information and give it to the other person in this other program who has another database program, if I can export it over here from Access 2016 into an XML file, then he can import that into his database program and vice versa. Now, in addition to the raw data that you can export into an XML file that strips it down without any formatting that might be incompatible in between the two programs, you have next what are called schemas. Well, that's fun. And they are a set of rules that can be tied to the XML file that can be used when it comes to defining the data types. Like, for example, as you recall in an earlier training video when it came to creating our tables, and we created the fields, like for the first name field, we said that the data type for this field is going to be text. For the date field, it would be set to the data type date, and the number field to the data type of number and so on. In addition, it'll hold information about the structure of the data. So when you have all this raw data, it will say all this data that is tied to the first name 
goes to the first name field with this data type. Last name goes to the last name field with that data type and so on. So we've got to have rules and structure, otherwise it's just a bunch of raw data. Now in addition to the XML and XSD files, you have what are called XSL that can be used to transform the data into an XML file or, in other words, used to apply formatting using the XSLT extension, exporting it to the Extensible Style Sheet Language Transformer. So if you look at all these, the XSLT, the XSD, the XML, they're all extensions. Now if you don't know anything about extensions, then I recommend that you watch my Windows training video on extensions, but we'll go over it just a little bit here. Now before you can import an XML file, let me show you what it looks like in its raw form. And let me minimize this down to the taskbar because on my desktop in the exercises folder, well there's the database that I want to import my data sitting in the XML file, which is right there. And then the XML here is linked to the XSD file because remember the XML file contains just raw data. The XSD file gives structure to the raw data, so it's not just a bunch of data floating all over the place. In other words, it'll say this data belongs to this field. Let's call it the first name of the client, and this data belongs to the last name of the client, or maybe just the street address. You see, it's organizing it into those fields and assigning it the data type. Like the first name field has the data type of text, and the last name, text, and so on. In any case, I want to be able to show you the contents therein, the behind-the-scenes coding, so you get a better feel for what XML is all about before we actually import it. Now when you look at this on my computer you see the name of the file which is customers for both the XML and XSD. Then you see the dot and the three letter suffix there. That's the extension of the name known as extensions. It tells the operating system what program to open this file up in. So like this one it automatically with the extension .accdb is tagged to the Access 2016 program. And so because it's tagged, it's got that cute little icon that it knows when I double click on it to open it up in that program. These two right here, well, if I double click on either one of them, it's like, uh, go ahead and choose a program to open this up in because you don't have a program on your computer that is tied to the XML extension that we can know to open it up in. So to view it, I can open up Notepad and it'll show me the raw data therein. Let's do that. Let me right click on it, go down to Open With, and let's do Notepad. Yeah, let me maximize that and well, you can see when I scroll over to the far right that it's linked to the XSD file that contains the structure. But over here is the raw data. Now if you don't know anything about HTML coding, well, I'll give you a, a brief rundown of it. But here it is. Here's the raw data, like one. You see over to the left, customer ID here. And then you see over to the right, customer ID, but it's got a forward slash. Anything that falls in between the two is the raw data. So it's tagging it with this HTML code that says customer ID, here's the first tag, and then the number, which is one, and then it closes it off. So that's what the forward slash means when it repeats the name. So you got the tag here, customer name, and anything becomes between the opening tag and the closing tag, which again, the closing tag represents the same name with the forward slash is going to be the customer name. So we've got the customer ID, the customer name, and then here's the address tags, open and close, that the address is in between, and then the city, Newport, and then the state, open and close tags, MA, and then the zip code. And then we've got, well, our notes, loves outdoor products in the sleeping bags and tents category. Oh, that's fancy. So that's for customer number one, or the ID number one, and then we got customer number two with the same fields here, customer name, address, city, state, zip, and notes, and customer three. Now with the raw data, let's take a look at the XSD file to see what kind of structure it's going to give to this raw data. Let's go ahead and close out. Now with the XSD, when you right click on it, it doesn't give me an open with notepad, so we got to do it the long way. Let's click on the start button, find our notepad, and open it up. And then within notepad, click on file, go to open, and, well, we're in the exercises folder, but it's looking for the text document, txt extension. Remember, this one, well, you can't see it right here, that's in the way, is the .xsd. So we got to change it to say, look, let's look at all files. And there you go, xsd. Double click, and let's maximize that, and there we go. Here's the structure to that raw data where we're looking at customers and here's the name of the structure, the name of the field customer ID, and the data type is going to be auto number. 
And is it going to be unique? Yes. So there's going to be no duplicates, primary key as it were. And then down below that, you got the customer name field. The data type is going to be text. And then you've got the maximum length of characters that it's set to as 50. And you've got the address field. The maximum characters is 45. The data type is text, text, text. And then the last one is memo, so it can contain more than 255 characters, which memo is an old data type from earlier versions of Access. Now it's, well, going to convert it to long text. And there it is for the notes. So all that is just the structure to it that defines it, the data type, the maximum length value, number of characters. And so let's go ahead and close out of that. And are we ready to import the raw data that's linked to this, that when it imports it, it tells that, well, let me right click and explain it one more time. Notepad, that the structure will say, okay, you've got all these customer IDs. Let me put them all in one column, the customer ID. You have all these customer names instead of just floating all about. We got to have structure where it says the customer names, put them all in the next column. And then in the next column, the addresses and the city state and so on. Does that make sense? I knew it did. Let's go ahead and close out and then open up the access database, double click. And then to import that XML file, we're just importing that file, but remember it's linked to the XSD to give it structure. So when it comes in, it'll have something that makes sense or that is importable into our access database as far as the cleanliness giving us the organization through that structure. Let's come up here, click on the external data, go to the import and link group, click on new data source. And we want to do it from file and hey, there it is, XML. Click on it and then let's browse for it. And it's on the desktop. So over here in the main area of the desktop, it's in the exercises folder. And we just want the raw data, but remember it's linked to this to give it structure. So if we select that, that wouldn't make sense because, well, first of all, we chose to open up the XML file. And second of all, that's got no data. So let's go ahead and double click on XML so it points right to it. And when we click okie dokie, there we go. It says it's a table or it's going to import it as a table. The name of the table is customers. Now, I already have a table over here. It's called customers, but it has the three-letter prefix, TBL. This one's not going to have it. So when I import it, you'll know the difference. The TBL customers was already there, and then just the customers is what we're importing. And there's the fields, the structure. Oh, that's nice. So all the customer IDs will be in the customer ID field. The three records, one, two, three, the customer names in the same field. Well, different records, of course, but their names are going to be in the same column and the address is in the same column and so on. And then down below the import options, if you just chose the structure, there'd be no data. It's like just importing the XSD file without the XML, the data. And then you can append that if you want to a table, but remember it's gotta have the same data type and same field names. And so if it did, over here in my customers table, I could just add the data over to it. But let's go ahead and do it as a separate table, structure and data, click okie dokie, close out and there's our customers remember that was already here the three letter prefix tbl and here's our new customers table double click and remember we only had a total of three records in there so we have the customer id and these are text fields here and the notes should be long text it said memo in the xsd structure but remember that was from the earlier access versions when you export this file it was the memo so we can go ahead and right click on it and go to the design view and there we go, it knew, it changed it. Well, it doesn't have memo as the data type, so it says, okay, your long text. Then right click, go back to the data sheet view and loves outdoors where well, we can hover over to the right hand side of the column header and click and drag until we can see more of that. If you watched the previous training video on learning how to import an XML file, Let's now learn how to export an XML file or to an XML file. So the example I want to do here is, let's do double click, something simple, products, Tiki Torch. Let's go ahead and close out and to export it as an XML file, come up here, click on the external data tab, go to the export group, and we want to go ahead and do XML, click on that. And then let's choose a place, browse, that's on the desktop, click save, click OK and select what data information will be exported. Well, the raw data, and then the structure, which is the XSD file. And then this one right here, presentation of your data, XSL, 
you don't include any formatting and also export it as a .html file using data from the XML file. I don't want to do that. I want to keep it simple. Let's just keep it these two and click okie dokie. That's it. Close out. Minimize that down to the taskbar. And it's these two guys right here. And I can see the extensions on my computer because I allowed it to show me the extension .xsd. And then when I select that one .xml, of course, you can hover over it. You can see the type in the pop-up XML document. But in any case, if you want to see the extensions, you can watch my Windows training video on extensions and how to view them or hide them. Or if you run into problems that you're trying to double click and open up a file and it doesn't know what program to open it up in, well, you got to find out which program it belongs to. And I show you how to tag it to that program. In any case, let's go ahead and take a look at these. So here's the raw data. We can right click on that one at least and open it with the notepad. And there's my raw data. Tiki Torch, see, there's the product, and then the price, and there it is, 1995. So raw data. And then for the XSD file that contains the structure, we can't right click on it, so we gotta click on the start button, open up Notepad, and then do file to open within Notepad to go to the desktop, and on the desktop, it's looking at the txt extensions. We need to say look at all extensions or all files. And there's the xsd right there. Double click. And there's the structure for the data that organizes it. So when somebody else wants to import that raw data, here's how it structures it into those fields accordingly. As you can see really quick, the name of the field is product ID and the data type is auto number. And it's going to be unique, so no duplicates. Now, Microsoft Outlook, if you don't know anything about it, basically it's an email program that also is a database for your contacts, people that you want to store their email addresses, website, phone numbers, and so on. In any case, you can go ahead and link to that Outlook contacts folder in the Outlook program. And if you don't know anything about Outlook, well, you can watch my training video on Outlook. But let's go ahead and take a look first, and I'll introduce it to you briefly so you know what you're importing here. Let's click on the Start button and open up Outlook 2016. Click on it, and there's a bunch of emails that I get. And down below in the navigation pane, we got the two dudes. Click on that, and it's a database for all my contacts, including me. See? And let's go ahead and double click and open up Carrie. There's all her information, the contact information that I have on her, email address, and oh, there's a birthday coming up. Ooh, you get pop-up reminders too. How fancy. Go ahead and watch my Outlook training videos, especially if you have all of Office. Might as well learn about it and find out how beneficial it can be for you when it comes to organizing your emails, your tasks, your calendars, appointments, and so on, and including your contacts. In any case, I digress. Here's their email address. Business, home phone numbers, address here that I can view on a map. In any case, let's go ahead and close out. So there's the details for Carrie. There's Barney Five, Ray Barone. So I can go ahead and import that contacts folder that contains all my contacts over into Access. And any changes that I make here will update it in Access and vice versa. Any changes I make in that link over in the Access database, like to well, Barney Five, will also update it here in the contacts folder. So let's go ahead and try it, close out of here. And to link it up to the contacts, just come up here, click on the external data tab, go to the import and link group, click on the new data source drop down arrow. And we're going down to from other sources and it's right there at the Outlook folder. Click on it and it gives you a bunch of options. Right now, I just want to link to the data source by creating a link table. Well, because you know, you can import everything as a table that's not connected to it, so I don't receive the updates that are made within the Outlook program, or I can add them to one of my tables as long as they have the same data type and type of data and labels for the fields. But let's just do link and click okie dokie. And there you go, the address book, click on the expand, has the contacts folder that I want to link to. So let's go ahead and select it and click next. And the name of the table will be contacts. I don't have anything else like that over here. So we're good. Click finish and it's done. Click okie dokie. And there you go. It's linked to it. You can see the address is pointing to where the file is that contains the contact. So when I double click on it or the contacts, we've got Barney Fife. And then we've got Ghost, Paranormal, and well, some of them. I didn't type in all their information, so it's not the best. 
in any case it's a table that I can go ahead and generate reports and queries and do my sorting and filtering and things like that and any changes I make in here will update in the contacts folder in Outlook and vice versa so if I do Barney Fife's and do shift enter well because it's linking it says it's deleted because it's got to go out and update it and so don't freak out about that you can refresh this one of a couple of ways you can either close out of it and open it back up or hit the F5 key on the keyboard and then it shows the update in the Outlook program the contacts folder plural fives so let's go back down here click on the start button open up Outlook come down here to the two dudes the contacts click on them and there he is fives there's the plural double click but what if I'm like no 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 you got it wrong Go ahead and delete the S, save and close, close out of here. Access has got to update, so it says it's deleted temporarily until you hit the F5 key on the keyboard, refreshes with the latest update, and there you go. No S in Fife. As you recall in an earlier training video, we learned how to create our tables, create the fields therein, and assign them a data type. Like the data type field here is auto number. And the rest of these are text fields where I can type in text or numbers or a combination of both. In any case, I want to introduce you to another data type field and it's called the attachment field. Where, just like it says, it allows you to attach like documents, zip files, and most images to your records here. And it will automatically compress the images and files if they aren't already. So to go ahead and add this other field with the data type attachment, let's well come up here, right click, go to the design view. And let's do attachment, hit the tab key, the data type, click on the drop down arrow, and it's right there, attachment. And then down below, you got the option to add a caption. So what you see is the field name will be for you in the design view. They won't see that up front if you type something else here for the caption. So we could do something like clip, like paper clip. You want to attach something, clip it to this record. In any case, that's what I'm going to do. And then let's come up here, click on the View button, and be sure to save your table. And hey, ooh, let me scroll over. There it is. Clip. So that's the caption that we see here. But back in the design view, the name of the field is Attachment. And you can see we got zero attachments or clips to the field. And to add one or two or many, just go ahead and you can either right-click on it and Manage Attachments. Or you can click on Add or Close Out. You can double-click opens up the same window. So we can click on Add, and it's like, okay, where are these? Well, there's the books image, double click, and let's add another. Let's add this document here, delete certificates path, double click, and when we're done, click OK, and hey, there you go, we have a total of two. Now you can see over here that it's still in right mode, so we haven't saved the record yet after we attached it, so we wanna save it. Let's hold down the Shift key and hit Enter, and there we go. And then to go ahead and access those attachments, we can just double click on it to open it up. And you can actually, with it selected, click on open or just double click on it. And it'll open up that image in the program that is associated with this extension.png. And so it's the Windows Photo Viewer. And if you want to learn more about extensions, you can watch my Windows training video on extensions. Close out. And this is a document. Double click. And there we go. And so once you open it up, you can, of course, well, I put the Save As on my Quick Access Toolbar. Click on Save As. Oh, we got to enable saving. And there we go. I can do it to the desktop and then save it right there. So it's on my desktop now out of the attachment. Well, it's still there, but it's a, as a copy. And click Cancel, minimize this down to the taskbar, and there it is. You can do it that way or... Let's restore this by clicking on the button. You can double click to open it up and just say, hey, I want to take this and save as. And that way you don't have to open it up to be able to get inside that file and that program that it opens it up in to save it to your desktop. You can go to the desktop and click save. But since I already have it there, it says, do you want to replace it? OK, so you can do it that way. In fact, you can take all the attachments and say, OK, save all of them and dump them all on the desktop or in a folder on your desktop or wherever you'd like. And then of course to go ahead and get rid of them, you can select it and remove it, but I don't want to do that, so I want to add it. And it's in the exercises folder on the desktop and the delete certificates path and click okie dokie. 
and we're in pencil mode so shift enter to save it and the reason why I want to keep it there is because I want to show you that when you create a form based upon a table that has this attachment field I want to show you what it looks like so let's go ahead and close out of here we got the table selected come up here click on the create tab let's go to the forms group and let's do form and there we go it's right there but we're not in the actual form view so let's right click on it we're in layout let's go to form and so there it is and to be able to access it you can see when I hover over it, it says double click to view or add attachments you can double click you can view them or add them click cancel you can right click on it and when you do that you can not only manage the attachments but let me click cancel as you saw there when you right click on it you can go forward and it takes you to the next clip that's in there and right click and go backwards and if you actually click on it you see that little mini bar up at the top you can go forward and backwards as well and also click on that little clip to manage the attachments so it's there you can still manage it within a form now if you need to save your access version 2016 to an earlier version like 2002 or 2003 well actually you can see up here on the title bar that the versions beginning with 2007 through 2016 is using the same file format so more specifically to that earlier version of 2002-2003 just go ahead and click on the file tab go backstage down to save as and why would you want to do this well maybe somebody has an earlier version of access that you want to be able to save it in that file format so they can have access to it and not have it freak out on them and let's come over here we can go ahead and choose one of these right here like there we go 2002 through 2003 or 2000 which is the earliest everything else is just bundled under the latest version and you can see the extension the different extensions ACCDB MDB MDB but this one's a little bit more different than that one so that's why we got two separate ones in any case you can learn more about extensions in my Windows training video on extensions and so you can go ahead and select that and do a save as oh it tells me can't do this because there's something that's not compatible with earlier versions and that can include attachments multi-valued fields large integers offline data data map who I'm getting worn out in any case if any of this sounds familiar like this one does attachments which I know click okie dokie is in my customers table okay that's definitely preventing me from saving it in an earlier version then we got to get rid of it or instead of deleting it from my table here I can make a copy of my database a backup copy and that way I can delete it from here so I've got the original in any case let's pretend that I made a backup copy so let's go ahead and right click to the design view and right click on the row header so I can delete that row and say yes and then go ahead and close out yes we have to save that now let's try it again file save as and let's go ahead and double click on that and hey it opened it up it's allowing me to make that change and let's see it's going to be saved to the desktop we'll keep it the same name but of course a different extension and click save and you can see up here I have it opened under this file format an earlier version of access 2002 through 2003 close out of that and it's right here on the desktop and you can see which one of these is not like the other you see that you got the latest version with that icon image a for access where the older version has that little key and you can see when I hover over it and you can see let me click off there you go the extension mdb as opposed to accdb so here's the latest version again and here's the older version the navigation form is a form you can create that comes with tabs that you can click on to display other forms or reports within that navigation form long story short it's like our good friend the ribbon where you can go ahead and click on one tab and it just updates the ribbon here and doesn't open up additional windows and so the navigation form is the same thing opens up one window where you can go ahead and click on one tab to view one form click on another tab to view another form or report and so on so that way you don't have to come over here and when you want to view two or three forms and reports you don't open them up with various windows here that you have to navigate through it's more organized when you get these buttons that you can click on to update the main window so to go ahead and create a navigation form let's come up here and click on the create tab go to the forms group and it's right there navigation you can see in the pop-up when I hover over it it'll create a form that allows people to browse to different forms and reports 
click on it, and you got some options. You can have tabs or buttons along the top of the form. Left hand side, right, two levels. Ooh, that sounds fancy. And you can have them both horizontal and vertical, but let's keep it simple. We'll start with the basic one. For our introduction, horizontal tabs, click on it, and you get one tab. Of course, when you add something to that tab, you can add additional tabs. And there's a couple ways you can go about adding a form or report to this Add New Field. One way is to go ahead and double-click inside of it and just type in the name of your form. FRM, contact, and hit enter. And ooh, there you go. Pulls it right in. You can do it that way, or if you're within the neck of the woods down below here, you can click and drag and drop it right on top of the next Add New. And then when you do that, well, there it is, Customers Form. You get another add new tab that you can go ahead and well let's do a report this time let's do category sales click and drag and put it right there close out of the field list we're in the layout view so that's why we still get the add new if we want to right click and go to the form view that disappears and let's take it for a test drive contact form oh that's nice customers okay pretty good except i have to scroll around and oh well you know how to update that in the design view of your form if you want to squish things more together so you don't have to scroll. But when it comes to a report, well, you may have to scroll. I got a lot of records there, like the very last one, Tiki Torch. And then if you want to go ahead and make some changes, let's right click as an example and, well, like the layout view here. Oh, we got to scroll up. And you've got FRM contact and you don't want that as the name. If you double click in it, you can go ahead and delete the three letter prefix and hit enter and that works or if you want to bring up the property sheet either here or in the design view well here we can just come up here on the design tab and go to the tools group and click on property sheet and then for the name of the button you can come over here on the alt tab and you can change it here I mean lowercase c come on we need an uppercase c and hit enter and it updates it and then, of course, for the back-end designer view in the layout or the design view for you, that is, who's designing this, you can refer to this as, well, the default is navigation button, but you can go ahead and abbreviate that and call it the nav. But, okay, I'm already hearing you laugh. But in any case, nav but, and let's call it the contact and hit enter. So that way, when I have a lot of things to work with in my form, if I can't find it readily that I can click on it, I can just click on the drop down arrow and you get all the navs together. Of course, these ones are navigation spelled out completely, but I abbreviated it nav but contacts like that and it selects the button there for me to work on. And then with this selected, you can go ahead and hit the delete key on the keyboard and it gets rid of it. So I just click on it once, hit the delete key, and it's getting rid of all of them. Now let me do something a bit more complex in case you decide to have tabs not only horizontally here, but also vertically as well. Let me close out of the form here and not save it. So let's come back up here, click on the Create tab, go to the Forms group, Navigation, and let's do Horizontal and Vertical tabs on the left-hand side vertically. Click on that, and there you go. Now when it comes to adding forms, add them up at the top first because the horizontal tabs are the main category. And the vertical tabs are the subcategories to the main. So, for example, let me go ahead and add my contact here. And then let's add a report to this one over here. And after I have my main tabs, like for the contact form, we could say the sub to that, that when I'm in that area looking at the contact, if I want additional information or something that's related to the contact, we can go ahead and add that form or report to the sub here or the vertical tab there. It's so like it could be like the customer info. Why not just customers there as well? So what that does is when I go ahead and I leave the main tab, those disappear. Well, let's go ahead and close out of here and right click and go to the form view so it looks cleaner without that add new tab. So I'm on the report category sales. When I go to the contact form, it shows me the subforms here, so I can go, oh, well, here's some more information, the customer info, click on that, and then the customers, and when I want to go back to the main category, there you go. As opposed to, let's right click and do it the wrong way, go to the layout view. When I go ahead and click on add new, I have the option to add it as a main or sub. Remember, do it as the main first because if, well, for example, if I click on this report and add it as a sub first, Okay, that's horrifying. I mean, look at that. We got a squishy here. Who likes squishies? I don't, unless it's raspberry. 
but man, that's crunched, and I don't like that. So let me go ahead and hit undo, and instead, add them up here at the top first, and then once you get that established, then go ahead and add your subs, either forms or reports, off to the left-hand side. And then one last thing I want to show you, I'm looking at this report right here, and let's go ahead and right-click and go to the form view, and we're scrolling down, and we get down to Tiki Torch. Now, if you want to print it off, don't do it in your navigation form. Let me show you. So with it selected here, if I went backstage file, down to print, and then I went to print preview, click on it to zoom in. Do you see Tiki Torch? No, it's cutting it off and I can't see it down below. And I don't get any additional pages. So if you want to do a print on your report, then open up the report itself. This is just for you as you're viewing them in the navigation form. Not something that, well, I would print because part of it won't print. Finally, I want to be able to cover the navigation forms at this point in level 3, not with the other form training videos earlier on, because in the next training video we have what are called switchboards, and it relates to it in the sense that it's another form that instead of having tabs on it, it'll have buttons. And these buttons, when you click on it, doesn't navigate within the form here, like as you saw here, it actually opens up the form or report which can be very handy because when it comes to printing a report, you don't want to be doing it in the navigation form. As you just saw, it cuts it off. So pick which one of these works best for you, a navigation form or a switchboard form. And the switchboard form is going to take a couple of training videos to set that up and show you. But anything that requires a lot of work, typically, I would say when it comes to access, allows for more flexibility. Now, if you're set on using the navigation form or any other form outside of the switchboard form, you want to watch the switchboard startup options training video because there I can show you how you can choose any form, but for that training video it's going to be for the switchboard form, but any form you can have it automatically open up at the same time you open up your database. So that may be very helpful. Thanks for watching. Hey, as a quick reminder, if you like my video, please give it a thumbs up. You can also click on me and subscribe to my channel to get notified of the latest videos, and for great specials on my products, please see the description below this video.